Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the Executive Director of the Oregon Entrepreneurship Network, Kara. How are we doing today, my friend? We're doing fantastic. I'm excited about this one, folks. I've been working with the OEN team. They, they do a lot of great work throughout the state of Oregon. That is all 98,000 square miles. In fact, they just recently had an event down in beautiful Ashland, Oregon, which is just north of California. But before we get into all that, Kara, please introduce yourself. I would love to learn who is Kara. Give us a little background. Oh, that is fantastic. Well, I do have to say thank you for pointing out that Ashland is almost to California. That was quite the trip. Um, really fun, cool entrepreneurs down there. So I'm Kara Toronto, and I am the executive director here at OEN. My background actually was in tech startups. So I worked for three different tech startups. The first one I started when I was like 22. We had no idea what we were doing. I was the 17th employee. And after nine years, we were a 300 person organization with six offices, and we were acquired by a global consultancy. Um, and I was like, this is amazing. Entrepreneurship is fantastic. I've learned so much. Look at how successful we've been. And then I went to my next year and I was like, huh, entrepreneurship is hard and they all don't go this way. <laughs> and so I've kind of been on both sides of the, the high growth, the turnaround, and then also like the unable to secure funding um, between a series A and a series B and going out of business. So I did that all in tech for the first like 10, 15 years of my career. And then um, just being in tech was a little overwhelmed by the fact that there were never any women or folks of color. So uh, rather than trying to change one CEO or executive's mind, I switched over into tech association work where I had access to hundreds of executives to really try to think about how we more thoughtfully build our companies and represent our leadership. And so um, I did that for about six years, seven years, which was really only supposed to be a six month contract. Um, and then was always considered really interesting because you don't have a lot of nonprofit or association leaders that were practitioners um, as well as you know people that grew companies. So I'd always been associated with the startup vibe. Like I've always been referred to as really entrepreneurial. And so about two years ago, this job opened up here at OEN and um, the board recruited me to apply. And it's been really fascinating because OEN does support the entrepreneurs, but we also talk a lot about growth strategies and how to access the capital. And now I have a much better understanding of the capital side, which I wish I had known like during my years as an entrepreneur. So that's kind of my background. I'm from outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in a tiny town called Norcross. Um, and in my spare time, I run a lot and I have a dog that just joined us. So um, yes, the dog has joined us. And, and folks, if you have not, I would encourage you to connect with Kara on LinkedIn because she has a phenomenal network and she does run a lot. I, I recently saw a bunch of her medals. I was like, oh man, that is cool. I don't think I can run that much. I'll stick with the Peloton every morning though. Now let's talk a little bit about OEN real quick, the Oregon Entrepreneurship Network. Give us a little background. What is it and what is it really here to support here in the state of Oregon? That's such a good question. So um, I would like to say that OEN is older than me. It is not, but it is in its mid thirties. And it was a really interesting organization that started, I'd love to tell this story, as a spin out of an MIT alumni association program that was really connecting successful entrepreneurs back into their community to say, hey, like this is what it looks like to grow and scale a company, to take a company to an exit. And this was all happening in the 90s when we know what was going on before the tech bubble burst. And they were out here in the Silicon Florist where you saw Techtronics and then all the spin outs from that. And it was really just like a monthly group that got together, had a lunch, heard a successful entrepreneur, and then came back the next month. Um, and then the organization started doing things in youth entrepreneurship and different kinds of trainings. And eventually there was no one left from the MIT alumni uh, on the board. And so the, the organization spun out as its own 501c3. And then over the course of 
30 years was really the first organization to support entrepreneurship in the state and helped create programs like the Venture Catalysts that were embedded in places like Southern Oregon and Bend and out in the Gorge and Willamette Valley, um, really started trying to do more than just connect the folks in the network to successful entrepreneurs, but really understand that the network is the funding mechanisms, the folks that help you grow your business, the government entities, the universities. And so it was about 10 years ago that OEN became OEN. Prior to that, it was the Oregon Entrepreneur Forum, which was just what it sounded like. Listen to people talk, leave. The network really <laughs> is connecting the founders with funders and the folks that help them grow their business. I say that OEN is an organization that creates opportunities for serendipity. And I think anyone that's an entrepreneur knows how important that is to their success. Yes, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, the networking piece uh, from the entrepreneurship perspective, finding a mentor uh, throughout your, you know, growth path is is so important uh, because it is kind of a lonely ride sometimes and it does feel like that. But let's let's take a step back because you, you mentioned, you know, one, that the OEN board kind of did re reach out to you, try to recruit you, but that was based on a lot of your experience. So let's take a step back. You mentioned, you know, the first kind of uh, iteration in, into the entrepreneurship world was the tech, and you had a lot of great experience. You did very well. Let's talk about how that experience helped you decide to, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and stick into this entrepreneurial ship uh, kind of bubble. Why, why did, why, what did you experience in that first kind of thing that really made you feel, you know what, I like what I'm doing? I love, like you asking that question almost makes me want to cry because I love the answer to this story so much. Um, I started a tech company because my dad said, you're going to be rich. Like it's the world of, it's it's the time of tech. I said, okay. And um, here I am, the 17th employee. They were like, do you know how to do HR? I was like, no, but that shouldn't stop me. And that's like, I think that was the first moment where I was like, oh, being an entrepreneur means you have to learn how to do a lot of things like all the time. And I just had this really like amazing experience that I can look back on in hindsight and think, wow, like I thought my manager, my CEO was so old when I was 22. He was probably like 27. He also had like very little clue as to what he was doing. And it was a really unique experience because everything was new, like everything, every opportunity, every um chance to fail every chance to succeed like i think my two favorite stories in my entrepreneurial journey was we the company grew um we opened an office i was working in their birmingham alabama office and they opened an atlanta office and i moved over there and at some point they're like hey we're gonna make you the general like the managing director of this office i said that is so cool again i'm like now 28 so zero leadership experience. They're like, you're responsible for the PL. I said, great. And I like get up to leave this meeting where I've been promoted and I get to the door and I turn around and I'm like, what, what do those letters mean? <laughs> and, <laughs> and what I have seen in my time at OEN is like, I hear these stories over and over again. Somebody sells their first product and they're like, the customer asked me to send an invoice. And I'm like, what is that? And it's so like, I loved that, like not knowing and everything being for the the first, like the first time. And then the second thing that I loved was I read a lot of business books because again, like my, ba my, my background was in exercise and sports science. Like I wanted to be the commissioner of the Southeastern Conference. And so oh. <laughs> like I, I had not, I, that's why I didn't lofty know. goals, I love it. <laughs> that's why I didn't know what the p &L was. So I was reading these business books and I was like, hey, I'm in a leadership meeting. I was like, I, I think we need like a vision and a mission and like uh, some core values. And I, I will never forget this. Our CEO, who is a man that I still talk to and I adore, was like, I don't know. That sounds like some MBA mumbo jumbo stuff. But if you want to do it, like, go ahead. And I feel like when you're working for a startup, like that's the only time in your career you're going to hear things like, I don't know, go ahead. <laughs> and so like as a team, we got a small team together, we wrote this and then Gabriel what became so powerful. It's like, as the company grew, that vision and mission and those core values were painted on the wall of every single office. And like, 
you don't get to see that when you're working at a company that you're not a part owner of. And what I now know in hindsight is like all that stuff that I was trying, hey, Kara, move back to Atlanta, hire customers. Hey, that was great. Let's do it again in another city. We were scaling and we were creating a portfolio that was diversified enough that made us a really interesting target for acquisition. But I didn't know that. And I didn't know that until like well after I left. And so I loved that time in my career. I think I will always think of it as my favorite 10 years, but I knew I could never go and do it again because I would never approach building a company with the same guileness that I had the first time. And so this opportunity at OEN was really about like getting to work with the folks that are approaching their companies for the first time with that like wide-eyed wonder and enthusiasm. And so I get to be a part of it without actually having to do it. But I love like stewarding that kind of enthusiasm into a growth story. I love it. And you know, one of the things you mentioned too was this was like you mentioned is a very successful first entrepreneurial endeavor, did it for several years, ended up being acquired. And then you moved on to a couple other techs, uh, a little bit different story. So talk about some of the challenges that you've experienced in your entrepreneurial endeavors. Yeah, I mean, I hear it all the time, but I will say like number one um, in that, in my last experience was really about finding the funding. And now that I know, again, now that I know more, cause I've had all of these different opportunities. I think part of the, the challenge with us finding funding was we didn't really have a clear exit strategy. And that's one of the things that we constantly talk to entrepreneurs about, whether they're building a mechanics garage or a 20 person executive recruiting firm that they want to leave to their kids, like understanding how you envision the end is really critical. And I was so young in my first experience that I didn't realize that like the CEO and the CEO and CFO, they had, they had planned that. And so like everything we did went towards that goal. And so in this, like my, what I would call my worst experience Every day was a different change in strategy. Like money was, we were burning through money. There were like multiple exit strategies and like the focus I think is what's really important. That was one of the hard ones. And then I think one of the other ones that was difficult, at least for me in tech, um, and I've seen this change particularly in the last five years and more so on the West Coast, um, or maybe it's just the world that I get to function in, but it was really difficult for me because I felt like everyone that was working in the startup was part of a group that I didn't know anything about. Like, like I don't want to say it was like the tech bro culture because I don't fully believe that. But it was like everybody knew somebody from like another exit or, you know, their caller or a previous investor. And I had come from a tech services startup, so it was really different. Um, and I didn't like, that was difficult for me. So I guess some of the cultural pieces and how one of the things we talk about now at OEN, like when you are just yourself starting your business, like think about your exit and like really intentionally think about how you're going to build your company and don't just let it be the people that you've known your whole life. Yes. Yes. Very true. And make sure to get uh, input from people outside of just, you know, the inner circle, because those are the folks that are going to give you, uh, those are truly your end users, uh, more than likely. And they're also the people that are going to give you some really good, valuable insight of whether or not you need to pivot or continue to move forward. And I really like the statement in regards to the mission and vision and values. Uh, I think that is really important because it, it essentially what it does is it creates your brand's core values, right? And so, there are going to be times as entrepreneurs or even in a corporate setting where you kind of feel like you're floundering a bit, right? You're kind of uncertain of where you're going to go and how you're going to move forward. And then you kind of tend to take a step back and, and you realize you, you read those core values again and that mission statement. And that really starts to create your true north again, right? And allows you to kind of move forward and, and build again. Now, one of the things you also mentioned, Kara, is you guys work, you work with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, you provide a lot of education and mentoring. What are some of the biggest, uh, what made say maybe either mistakes or concerns that entrepreneurs run into when they're actually trying to scale their business? I love that question too. Um, we talk a lot and I know that because of your background, you will understand this comment, but as an entrepreneur, you have to speak a lot of languages. And there are a whole bunch of different business languages. And there is no one 
that I have met that is fluent in all of them. And so one very, of the- So it, very true. Yeah, and I'm like sitting here like laughing to myself. I'm like, I mean, you couldn't say that about even the most successfully exited of revered founders in the world. Like they, there are still things that they are not good at and that's why they build really strong teams. And so one of the things that I consistently see is maybe a lack of awareness that that is a language competency that you need. And so what what I see primarily is folks are really good at their idea, whether it's a food product or a tech product or a life science product or their service that they're opening. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're really good at building a sales pipeline, understanding their financials, like doing risk assessments of their business. Um, and if they're, a lot of them tend to unintentionally be good at marketing just because they know their, their product so well. And so one of the things that we see a lot and have started exploring more as OEN when we talk about the folks that can help you grow your business is how do you recognize those gaps early and bring in fractional support? Like I think coming out of the pandemic, you see fractional support being even more readily available, people wanting more flexible work schedules. Um, and we strongly encourage that, particularly around the financial piece. Um, we don't ever want to see the entrepreneur taking out a second mortgage without having first like built a really good financial model template. And there are so many and we have access to so many. And so that's that's what I would say would probably be one of the biggest things that we see people running into is not being fluid in all the business areas or knowing who to go to to help them understand that functional area. Yeah. And, and, and folks that are listening, I, I think that's a big piece too, is, um, you know, reaching out to folks. There's a lot of people within the entrepreneurial ecosystem, specifically here in the Pacific Northwest that want to see you succeed in your business. Uh, and, and truly they have a lot of, uh, to Kara's point, um, there's things I know, I know there's things I don't know. I don't know. Right. And so like understanding that there's just things I don't know, I don't know, uh, and reaching out and trying to find that information is very valuable. Now, Carrie, one thing you also mentioned was funding, uh, the difficulties of funding for entrepreneurs. One, can you kind of talk about some of the difficulties and then two, can you, uh, provide some of the, some of the advice that you give entrepreneurs when they're looking for funding? Yeah. Um, well, funding is hard. Money is hard to find. And there's not enough money for everybody and not all ideas are going to be funded. Um, so that's sort of the baseline. One thing that we've changed the narrative around at OEN for a long time, it was, you know, just pursue equity capital. And now we're doing a lot of education around, okay, equity capital is an option and for high growth or, you know, an, an IPO, it's probably the best option, but there are other avenues that you can pursue. There's debt financing, there are business grants, there are different lending programs, there are micro loans, there is crowdfunding, there is a whole variety of, of ways that you can access capital. And then the other thing that we talk about is be realistic about what you're trying to raise and why. And I will give you some, uh, uh, like just some random examples. Um, if you are making a food product, do you need to be doing the manufacturing yourself? Do you need to be doing the bottling yourself? Could you share a particular mold with another brand and cut that capital investment in half? And I don't know that first time entrepreneurs think through that, we tend to hear it from folks that have come back and are talking at a pub talk about how successful they've been. And it's always that we've managed to do what we anticipated or more with less money. And so that's, that's some of the advice that we give, as well as just connecting to a whole bunch of different resources, both locally and nationally. Like if you are a QuickBooks customer, um, a QuickBooks loan can be approved in 24 hours if you are already using them up to $10,000. So there's, there's avenues. Um, 
And I want to go back to something that you were mentioning previously about people in the Pacific Northwest being very supportive and wanting to see you succeed. We're going through our Angel Oregon Food Program right now where we invest in a company. And several of the companies that are now really investable have been through the program a few times. And what's amazing is how many of them reference a, a another OEN investor or contact that they met who is willing to give them one hour of time and say, hey, your product isn't fully developed yet, but try to get in front of a buyer with Whole Foods now because it may make two years to, to build that relationship. So, and also sometimes investors have really great ideas around different funding resources, particularly if they are well-versed in your industry sector. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And again, um, I really like what you mentioned uh, with with different funding options, and in particular like crowdsourcing. I, I, that one is a really good option for like if you're creating a product uh, and you don't want to do mass production on the product, well, test the market. See if you have, if see if your minimally viable product has a product market fit, and you can do that by crowdsourcing. Uh, Burnside Knives just recently came out with their kitchen knives. Really smart idea. Uh, transitioning, you know, vertically integrated from pocket knives to kitchen knives. Did a crowdsource and see see who's uh see you know did the crowdfunding and see who's available who wants it, and that thing you know sold out within thirty days and so you can see uh, right then and there. In fact, I was talking to a recent entrepreneur. They're starting to think about getting into the skincare product line, and and one of the things I mentioned to him because the skincare product in particular is a touch feel kind of and smell kind of item, um, so I really encourage them instead of going you know pardon my French, but balls of the wall right at the beginning and getting 15,000 units that we're unsure if we're going to sell them all. It makes sense to go get some small samples, go out to a couple of farmers markets and test those, uh, test them out with clients. And again, to Kara's point, asking somebody outside of mom and dad to test them, right? Uh, go into a market that uh, these individuals are actually going to use it. So that's another good point uh, is actually identifying who that customer is within your market and really narrowing that down, uh, you know, to the to the age, to the demographics, the, what they tend to like, right? Because that will also help you in your marketing later on. Uh, for example, probably is not the greatest idea to go advertise a hamburger right outside of 24-hour fitness. Maybe it is, I don't know, right? But, you know, product placement is also important too. And so, so building that uh, is really important. Now, Kara, one of the things you kind of alluded to quite a few times is, is the power of networking. How, how important has networking been to your career? Well, um, I have this job because I met Riley O'Brien and Skip Newberry from the Technology Association at an event out here in Portland in 2016. And I had that job because the former CEO of the organization I was working for at the time was like, oh, Kara can help with a transition. And I knew that former CEO because I had been a member of his organization when I was in my very first job. And so like everything can be traced back actually to a lunch that I met a woman who then hired me in my very first job. So I can go back like four 25 years and tell you the person that probably got me here today. Um, and then I had worked really closely with my predecessor, Amanda Oborn, and she reached out to me and was like, I just think that you're a really great fit. And so again, it was like having networked. And now what's great is like the network that I have, I can leverage to help other people. And I think that is so powerful. Um, and folks that understand how important the network effect is will succeed far better than the folks that don't embrace it. And I know it's like awkward and weird and not easy to do. Um, we try to make it easy at our events. And I understand that if you are introverted it is much more challenging, but I promise like just talk to one person and you will gain value out of being in an OEN room. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, this, this the power of networking 
um, is, is just phenomenal because again, I think, you know, Karen, I mentioned this a few times, the, the Pacific Northwest in particular, I, I've been to other communities and I'm not saying anything bad about those communities, but I certainly feel, uh, the love in the Pacific Northwest in regards to economic development and really trying to encourage generational wealth within our entrepreneurial ecosystem, which I really do uh, love. In fact, you also mentioned Amanda Oborn, which is a, a perfect time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship website. So as Amanda is a four Former, uh, former guest. So if you actually visit the shades of e.com, you can also sign up for the newsletter, which is a great time to plug that as well. Uh, but yeah, again, I, I think it's a, uh, the, the power of networking is, is really phenomenal because I think it, again, one, you learn from a lot of individuals from their expertise, but the beauty of it is, is as Kara kind of uh, illustrated is if you, you know, the reward for a job well done is the opportunity to do more. Jonas Salk once said it, he's the individual that came out with the polio vaccine. And I think that's exactly what Kara is. You know, she, her reward for a job well done has been the opportunity to continue to do more with OEN to the point where they actually targeted her like, hey, we really would love your you to kind of help lead this ship. And you have been, you've been now leading a uh, OEN uh, for about a couple of years now. Now, with that said, where, where are we going? What's the future for OEN look like? What uh, uh, spit out some couple events that are coming out for our listeners. Oh my God. I love to spit out events. And then I'll tell you the big strategy. So uh, Monday, we're actually going to be in Corvallis. We've been on a major road trip. We've got 10 companies at a pitch practice session for uh, really great coaches, including two entrepreneurs. We'll give them feedback. Observers are welcome, but only if you are an entrepreneur. This is not an event for investors or business service providers. So if you're in the Corvallis area on uh, May 31st in Slabtown at the Tillamook Outpost from three to six, we're going to be hosting our pop up and pitch marketplace, which is 20 of our local food and beverage entrepreneurs sampling their wares. It is delicious. It is oh, that sounds awesome. It is open to the public and children are welcome. And 12, 10 of these intrepid entrepreneurs will get up on a stage in this marketplace and pitch their product live for three minutes with only their product, no Love slides, it. nothing else. And then on June 6th, we will have um, the announcement of our Angel Organ Food investment at McMinniman's Mission Theater in Northwest Portland at four, starting at four, ending at seven. You'll see the five companies that we think are the most investable in the market right now, and they will be getting probably upwards of $150,000 investment live and on the stage. So that's oh, very man, exciting. That's great. And then our, our last event for June is a, uh, a wine networking event down at Stoller in the Mid Valley. Um, and I will tell you, it will be the least expensive opportunity to network with other founders <laughs> and funders at Stoller because I think their tasting is like $25 a person and I think our event's 15. So um, we've got those coming up that starts at five. And then just sort of um, random aside, OEN does raise these small funds. I alluded to our angel organ one and um, we were going to do food and life sciences this year in a group of very intrepid tech entrepreneurs and investors encourage me to raise a tech fund. So if you are a technology company interested in a small investment, we are seeking those companies to apply by June 10th. And the, the, uh, the form is on our website under our programs tab, but it's our AO tech investments. So then we'll have a party to announce that too. So stay tuned. Um, Overall, OEN this year, last year, we kind of, we redid our vision and mission and our core values a little bit more and really wanted to recenter the entrepreneur in the narrative. And so our number one goal is how many entrepreneurs can we serve? And I get asked that question, like, what does serve mean? If you're an entrepreneur, that's going to mean something different for you. You may need a connection. You may need a lawyer. You may need a funding path. Um, you may need an education session. You may need a pitch practice. So we are here to do all of those things. Um, we were pretty excited in our education programs in Q1 alone. We served 52 companies, 21, which were first time entrepreneurs going through business essentials and 31 going through one of our investment readiness programs. Wow. And I think that's really impressive because we are a team of three. And yeah. that does not include the two pub talks we did the three pitch practices we did for another 30 companies and the event we spun up 
to teach folks how to make their pitch look good, their deck look good, that we had another 33 companies attend. So that's our focus. Oh, and we had an entrepreneur mixer too over breakfast, which very different breakfast crowd of entrepreneurs than happy hour crowd. So we're going to flip flop back and <laughs> forth between those two. So folks, again, if you heard this, they have a, they have a tech fund. Uh, they got a lot of phenomenal events coming up. In fact, uh, OEN.com, I would highly org, recommend. Org. Oh, sorry, OEN.org. I'd highly recommend checking out the Oregon Entrepreneurship Network website. I have a lot of great events coming up. And again, funds, great way to really help support entrepreneurs. Uh, and again, uh, they're just continuing to grow. I really am, I care, I got to tell you, I really am so proud to see how OEN has really expanded throughout all 98,000 square miles of our state. You know, seeing, hearing Corvallis, hearing Ashland, you know, hearing all these places that, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors throughout this entire state, and there's so much innovation across the across the state lines as well. And so just amplifying that has been very humbling and being able to talk to a lot of the folks that have worked with OEN is, is very uh, impressive because uh, it's phenomenal the amount of work that you guys have done for the last two, three, almost three decades now. So you guys almost have really been decades, almost yeah. four decades. It's, it's, it's incredible how, how they continue just to build. And, uh, I'm, I'm just really proud of the guys. And in the, again, there's only three of them, ladies and gentlemen, three employees and they're kicking butt. I am telling you, they truly, truly are. Now, what would you say, you know, you have these coaching moments, you do some pitch decks and things of that. What is, what is the one piece of advice that you tend to give all entrepreneurs? Or maybe it's multiple pieces of advice. You know, I get asked to look at so many pitches and give so many advice. Like the first thing I usually say is who else has already looked at this and given you feedback? Because there are, to your point, there are so many people in this community that are willing to help that I respect. And so before I tear something down or disagree, I'd like to know who gave that feedback because oftentimes there is a industry expertise because like I'm a jack of all trades, master of none except for running. And so I like to know who gave that input. Um, the next thing that I tend to offer from a suggestion standpoint, just because this is a common mistake, less stuff on your slides, less is more, have an appendix if an investor wants to ask. And the thing I've learned this year through one of our pitch events that I've started talking to people about is even if you only have three to five minutes, practice with intentional pausing because it adds a dramatic effect that makes you easier to listen to. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. In fact, you know, one of the things you mentioned right there is um, less is more. I always encourage, you know, when I'm working with entrepreneurs and they're with their pitch deck, use visuals more than words. Uh, yeah. One one person said, don't put bullets in your presentations because bullets do one thing and they kill and they're going to kill your presentation. I don't <laughs> want to, if I can look at your presentation and read the slide, then there is no point for you to be up there telling me what's on the slide. Right. Yeah. And so utilizing visuals, I always encourage entrepreneurs when they first start there and, and Kara, I really got to say, I really love your idea about asking first who has reviewed this because there are a lot of phenomenal people. And to your point, um, they have expertise in areas I probably do not have. I'm more of the healthcare section kind of person. And so, uh, you know, having that insight and knowing who's already provided some valuable information is a good, good start. And then one thing I always encourage them is, is share your personal story. Cause most most entrepreneurs, when they get into entrepreneurship, they're solving a problem, but the problem tends to be a core issue with them themselves, right? Uh, maybe they grew up in a certain area and this problem existed, or maybe they have this kind of issue health-wise and this problem existed, and so they're trying to fault us, solve that solution. And that piece right there, when you start to talk about your own personal experience and why this uh, solution to the problem is important really starts to humanize you as a person and also makes the problem practical, right? It's like it's like doing a case study in healthcare, right? We do a lot of data, right? You can look at the New England School uh, Journal and all, all sorts of medical jargon in there. But then when you go into a community and you have to disseminate that jargon down to really uh, in layman's terms, 
it's imperative to use a case study so you can say, hey, here's all the data. Now, let me tell you about a case study to make it practical sense, uh, because it's it's very difficult sometimes if you're just spewing out, hey, here's my 10, you know, my five year trajectory and here's my you know finances and like, OK, well, what is exact what's a problem you are trying to solve? Right. Yeah. What's your North Star? Where's your core values that you're centered on? as you're making these decisions. And then one other thing which might surprise people because everyone always tells me like, you're so excitable, you've got great energy. Yes, and I am like a stickler for details. So like, I will be the first person to find the misspelling in your deck that you've looked at 700 times. So, so get somebody true. else's, you can get my fresh eyes on your deck if you just want grammar, <laughs> if you do have any words in there. Yep. And, and folks, I'm a, I'm a healthcare, so I'm an academia, cite your sources. If you're if you're gonna yes. if you're putting some data on a on a on a slide, please cite your sources. Just on the bottom, just say source from whatever it places wherever it's coming from, uh, because that's really important too. And I really like your uh, thought too about putting the appendix. I always encourage that as well. Like if you're gonna have a lot of data, hey, check out the appendix, right? If you want to get into more granular information about that, um, and then being mindful about how many slides you have is very important. Again, you have three minutes. So kind of think about, do you want to spend a one minute on each slide? So you're going to have three slides, right? So, yeah. so you kind of have to be mindful. And then also think about your pitch as like a, basically a condensed version of your elevator or a, a more of a exaggerated version of your elevator pitch. So your elevator pitch is like a 30 second boom really quick while your pitch deck is just a little bit more exacerbated than that. And that will lead you to the point okay, now we can have a conversation. You sparked my interest. Now we can have the 30 minute call, right? Which yeah, then leads yeah. to the hour, which lends leads to so on and so forth. And it continues to build. Your pitch deck doesn't need snapshots of your financials that's in your data room. Like it doesn't. That's for a, that's for a next conversation. Like if an, if, if an investor or a customer or a future employee is not interested in your idea, they're not going to care what your financials look like. <laughs> that, that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's, they... You are the brand, you know, yeah. you are the brand. So it's, it's very important. Now, as you continue to grow OEN and you continue to uh, bring on what, what is outside of OEN, what is Kara's aspirations? Where, where does Kara see herself in five, 10 years? I don't know. You sound like my therapist and my <laughs> rolled into one. Um, that is a really good question. I really, um, enjoy teaching so like part of that was my, my degree is actually in education and coaching um because again like I was gonna be the commissioner of the SEC and of I was gonna you, I think you still day. will be one day yes yeah one day that's still my aspiration I don't know how it's gonna happen from Portland but it's an aspiration um when I I took six months in between TAO and OEN and what I said was I either wanted to work with young people or young companies and right now, like I'm middle age. So, you know, there's like probably a 50, 50 split of people that are younger than me doing this and people that are older than me doing this. But I, I, I still envision at some point that I will do more of the coaching and teaching of next gen entrepreneurs. Um, I like analyzing businesses. I think it's fun. So I'm going to keep doing this for the time being. Um, but the other thing I've always wanted to do for talking dreams, I've always wanted to write a book and who knows if maybe I learn enough in this process that I can leverage that into something that the market thinks is interesting. Oh, I believe you have enough insight to definitely write a book. In fact, I would highly encourage to care, create like Kara's blog and just start, you know, just, like write once it. A, just once a week, start putting out a blog and then that eventually repurpose that blog for uh, for your book. I truly think you have more than enough uh, information experience uh, and then also gathering the stories from the entrepreneurs and, and saying, hey, would you be okay with me sharing your story in my book as an example? Uh, again, going back to that case study when you're when you're doing data, but I I would encourage you to, I would highly, I would highly, I would certainly read it. I, I'm a book nerd, so I would I would definitely read it. And if you put a book would... or two in there, an elf, I'm totally going to read it because I'm a fantasy book nerd as well. Oh, I got mermaids. Yes, that's my jam. Okay, I'll, I will, I'll get you a signed copy in five there you years. Go. So you see mermaids, now you're jumping into my four-year-old daughter territory. She's all about the mermaids. Now, before we leave, I would love for you to, how for guests that are interested, maybe learning more about OEN, maybe they want to connect with you. How do they connect with you? How can they find you on the website? 
Well, they can find me on LinkedIn, always Kara Toronto. And then we are again, that small and tiny staff. So if you cannot remember how to spell my name, which is C-A-R-A at OEN.org, I also answer the info box. So you can find me at info at OEN.org. And I would say, check us out. Like if you're interested and you're not sure, shoot me a note. We love to comp people to an event to let them check it out. Um, and we hope that folks join and find value and we're realistic. Like we don't really think you should be an OEN member for the rest of your life, unless you're an investor, then you can stick around forever. Um, but if you're an entrepreneur, like you should either be growing into one of the trade associations or chambers um, or, you know, your business doesn't make it and you figure out the next one and then you come back. So we are open for business and welcome any kind of interaction that folks want to have with us. I love to connect with people over coffee and hear their business ideas. You know, I really love that you said, you know, even if you figure it out and it doesn't come to fruition you know, and you leave, you come back, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, I always say, you know, I've never failed a day in my life. I either learn or I succeed. And I think that's true about entrepreneurs. Uh, even if they may not succeed in that first entrepreneurial endeavor, they'll go back to the drawing, they'll pivot and they'll come back with something because they've, they've learned from those mistakes. Just as Kara was mentioning how much she's learned during her tech job. And that's why she is so successful today. Uh, now, Kara, again, I, I, I'm very thankful for you being on the show and folks that are listening. If you want to connect with Kara, I will also have this information the, the week before the episode airs, the week the episode airs, and the week after the episode airs on the Shades of Entrepreneurship website. You can subscribe to that at theshadesofe.com. You can also follow us on the social sites at the Shades of E by visiting Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. Now, Kara, before we leave, is there anything else you'd like to let the listeners know? Yes, I'm very excited that I'm going to share a stage with you in November. This is true. Our entrepreneurship awards. This is true. We I did forget to mention I have been I'm very thankful and very excited and nervous at the same time. But I will be hosting the 2024 Oregon Entrepreneurship Network Awards. I'm very excited. Now, can you provide us a little bit more information and date and kind of a if if, inter, if folks are interested in that event, where can they find more information? It actually just went live this week. Um, it's uh, the Wednesday after the election. What is that? November. Oh, you're going to test my brain now. It's the first Wednesday in November. It's going to be a celebration of all things. It's the 6th, November 6th, Sentinel Hotel, downtown Portland. It is going to be a celebration of all things entrepreneurship. And I guess those are my like closing words. Like I have the best job because I get to support the dreamers, the innovators, and the disruptors. And I just hope that one day when they are all famous and wealthy, that they remember me and maybe make a small donation to sweet little nonprofit OEN. Um, but it is very inspiring to support a community of people that are pursuing their passions. I love it. And I feel like I have the second best job because I get to interview <laughs> the doers, the disruptors and the innovators. And so again, thank you, Kara, so much for joining us. Folks, again, please subscribe to the newsletter by visiting theshadesofe.com or you can visit us at the social sites by visiting theshadesofe. Thank you and have a great night.